church, it is so good to gather with you like this today. John and I actually look forward every single week to this gathering. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I think about it though when we're in our living room yep. and we're watching church on TV and I'm thinking how many others are doing the very same thing. We used to come together in this building yep. and we'd sit in seats close to each other, which was great. But, um, you know, the seats now are a little bit more comfortable there. Um, anyway, we all get I to do this I would take the together. ones in here any day, but I I'm know. not complaining about what we do. And you know what? We do love the fact that every week following the service, we have a community group. And we do it on Zoom right now, and we won't do that forever. But if you're not in a community group, no time like the present to join in. But today we've got lots of great things planned. So welcome to our service this week. We are going to go into a, a worship experience mm -hmm. and I, that's important to use that word because yeah. worship isn't something you do, it's something you experience yes. and the Holy Spirit will be there. We'll have a great time and then we'll come out of that. Take a, a minute or two to reflect. We're going to actually receive communion mm -hmm. also together today and then we've got a great message by Brandon.
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so Like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful You are. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes In grace is an ocean we're all seeking So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss And my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about
he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Wow, how he loves us. And you know, he loved us so much that he took our place on the cross. And he told us that we should remember in a very physical way how he did that by receiving communion together. And you know, when this pandemic first started, you remember there was two things that the Holy Spirit gave me that we need to all of us be doing on a regular basis. And one was receiving communion. Yeah. You don't have to go to a place to receive communion. You just have to together actually be thankful and, and receive, he said, take this bread, but you can take anything like that and take this cup and you can take anything like that and remember the body that he broke and the blood that he shed mm -hmm. on that cross that paved the way for our freedom. So we're gonna do that right here. And I encourage you at home, take a moment right now and receive communion. We love to receive communion together. There's just several things that John said were very, very important as we were walking through this pandemic together. One of them is absolutely receiving communion together, whether you're in that room by yourself or whether you're with others. Do this faithfully and watch God just meet you in the most beautiful way, and I trust he's just done that with you right now. Also, one of the things that have become more essential that has become more essential than ever is just giving that so aware that in this season this is not a time to draw back it is a time to press in more than ever with intention and i am so grateful for a church community relate church you're magnificent you have continued to press in and to give and i am so grateful and i know more than anything as it has left your hand it has entered your future and how amazing is it that it is a partnership with god this is not our ability to meet the needs of people it's God's ability but he invites us into this so I want to encourage you once again let's go and let's give and do whatever we can and your money can go places where you perhaps can't go and we have been able to sow into our community through things like uh, outreaches like the Dream Center, Mercy Ministries, we are involved in giving to Watoto Ministries and what we are about to do and through this offering is actually go to India. And we're gonna do that as we partner with great friends of ours that are on the ground there called Vision Rescue. Pastor Bijou Thampi is a great friend. And what they are doing there is truly, it, it, it's beyond, isn't it? It's amazing. And uh, their work is very recognized and very reputable and very trustworthy. And they are hurting in India right now. India is under siege, if you will, just what has happened through this period of the pandemic. How amazing that here we can partner and be assured that the finances are going right into the hands of the right people that can help people on the ground there. So we're getting ready to give and I wanna encourage you right now to get involved. There's many ways to give. On your screen it will tell you how, but I would love to pray over our giving today and to do this together with faith and with great expectation for miracles. You see, one day we're not gonna be here living on earth anymore. 
we are going to be in heaven. And uh, everything we do on earth will have fruit in heaven, that which we partner with, with God. And so I believe it's so important to see that. Like I said, when it leaves your hand, it enters your future because God is in our future and we get to partner with him. So let's pray. Father, I am so grateful that you do give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God, I am so thankful that you entrust us with something as simple as finance, as money. But God, in our hands, as we put it into your hands, now we can expect miracles and breakthroughs. God, we pray for, for the India and all that is happening there. God, would you intervene? And God, even the seed that we sow today with faith and expectation, I thank you that it will translate into lives being cared for, lives being saved, literally vision rescue, that we go with a vision to bring rescue to the people of India. Thank you, God, for the work of vision rescue and what they're doing. Thank you, God, for Relate Church and all that it is doing as it is sowing seed into our community and beyond. Thank you, God, that you bless this offering today. We, we ask you to put your anointing on it and your ability to do above and beyond, just like loaves and fishes did in the hands of God. We put our loaves and fishes into your hands and trust you for miracle outcomes today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You said something that just, wow, disturbed me. You said, um, in this offering, we're doing something special. We're going to India. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times over the years I said, you might not, not be able to go, you might not be that missionary, but your money can actually take you there. And people yeah. isolate it right now, thinking, I can't go anywhere. Yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> you can go yeah. with your finances. So yeah. thank you. We're going to get into a great message on the book of John again oh, as we so look exciting. into the, the life and times of Jesus. And we get to understand what is the difference between truth and grace. And Brandon, who over sees all of our young adults and youth is going to bring a great message. So lean in. Well, Relate Church, we have done it. Give yourselves a round of applause, a pat on the back. Maybe if you're really ambitious, you can give like a cheer in your living room. You may not know why we're celebrating, but today is a big day. We together as a church have made it to the end of the book of John. It's prologue. We have finished, we are wrapping up, should I say, the introduction of John's book before we get to the meat and potatoes of all that he has to say. John begins his biography on the life of Jesus by sharing the who and the why before he gets to the what. And John is definitely not an unbiased source. He has a bent to tell us about who his dear friend Jesus is. So far in this series, The Life and Times of Jesus Christ, we have learned that Jesus is the Word. And this, uh, this phrase was meaningful both to the Jews and to the Greeks of that time. And we learned that, uh, that Jesus was uh, God, but also uniquely distinct. That in some way, those two dynamics existed in what we know today as the Trinity. We learned that that word, Jesus, became flesh, that God came and put on a meat suit and lived with us. We learned that Jesus is the light and that the darkness of this world cannot, will, is not able to overcome the life and light that is Jesus. And then we are called to be witnesses to that light into the world. We have learned that we are called children of God, adopted into his family as sons and daughters. And hey, can I just encourage you that if you haven't uh, spent time listening to these teachings in this series, I would encourage you, go back and listen to them because there's so much that, uh, that we're learning that's setting the pace for the rest of the book of John. Um, just to give you a reference point as to where we were, were at, if this was a Star Wars movie, we would be past the... Uh, it, in a long time ago in a galaxy far far away that would be like in the beginning was the word and now we've worked our way up through the title scroll and we're in the last couple of sentences before the camera pans down and we get to the action um, unfortunately there are no wookies or lightsabers in this book and there is a character of luke 
in the Bible, but he doesn't show up until the next book, the book of Acts. But all, uh, all Star Wars references aside, there is a lot of gold that we're going to be learning today. So we're going to hop right in. I'm going to be reading from John 1, and we're actually going to start at verse 14, and then we're going to pop over to verses 16 through 18. So let me read. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. All right, we've got a lot to cover today because there is a lot of good stuff in here. And I just want to share with you three things that we discover about Jesus. First of all, we discover the character of Jesus. Second, the invitation of Jesus. And third, the gift of Jesus. So let's start at the first point, the invitation of Jesus. I'm just going to read over that scripture, just the beginning part one more time. We have seen the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, as I've been reading this, you may think I'm just repeating the same words, and that is because John uses a couple of words here multiple times. In fact, in just a few short sentences, John uses the word grace four times and truth twice. It's John's way of saying to us, this is the full embodiment of who Jesus is. If you were to cut him open, he would bleed grace and truth. If you cut me open, I would bleed like coffee and useless facts and probably a bad attitude. But with Jesus, grace and truth. And this is like, uh, you know, this is pretty esteemed words. You know, they say as you get to know somebody more, you see the real them. Like you see the best parts of them but you also see the worst parts. And I know for the people in my world who I've gotten to see closer, I've seen the, the, the great things about them, but oftentimes we also see uh, the not so good stuff. We see how people can tend to be ungracious in specific circumstances or how they can bend truth to their favor. But here we see that John, who spent ample time with Jesus says, if I were to describe him in just a couple of words, I would say he's full of grace. And truth. Now, here's what I will say. While these are great and kind words about John, he didn't pull these words out of thin air. In fact, these words are actually a reference pointing back to Old Testament scripture found in the book of Exodus. This scripture here, Exodus 34 verse 6, is actually the most quoted scripture in the rest of scripture, if that makes any sense. It's quoted 25 times in other parts of the Bible. And here's what it says. It says, it says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. What's happening here is uh, Moses and God are having an interaction where God actually speaks to Moses and he describes who he is. He says, the Lord, the Lord, or, or in Hebrew, his name, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. And he says, this is my character. He says, I'm a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, you might be saying to yourself, um, I don't see grace and truth in here. I see gracious, but I don't see truthful. Okay, track with me for a second. Um, the book of Exodus, as with the rest of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, was written in Hebrew. Uh, but at the time of Jesus and John, it had been translated to the common language of the day, which was Greek, like we have a translation today in English. And this translation was known as the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, it renders that last line there, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness as full of covenant love or grace and truth. 
Now, we're going to get back to, to uh, th- these lines, back to the book of Exodus throughout this message, because there's actually a lot of connection points. There's a lot of hyperlinks back to this book. So if you have your Bible with you, maybe you can grab one of those little tassel things and put it to the book of Exodus, because we're going to come back to it. But what I want to do here is I just wanted to define for us the terms grace and truth. Let's just tease them out a little bit, starting with grace. The Greek word for grace is the word charis. And in Hebrew, it is uh, ken. I, I, I'm not pronouncing it right. It's K-H-E-N, not like Barbie and Ken, K-H-E-N, probably a little more guttural than I'm saying. Um, but it can mean a handful of things. It can refer to something's elegance, that it, something is worthy of favor, therefore it is valuable. But most often, the word grace refers to a kind of gift. It is to show favor and generosity to someone regardless of worth or value. 47 times in the Old Testament, the writers cry out to God saying, let me find favor or let me find grace in your eyes. And it's almost always said in subversion to power structures. It's when somebody who is of higher status or or higher moral ground, instead of coming down with anger or with justice, instead turns their hand to lift the person up. It's an act of grace and love. And it's motivated not by selfish desire, or by trying to advance yourself, but it's motivated by that steadfast, loyal love, or as Jesus uh, would call it, agape love, God-centered love. And what it is, is it's doing the best thing for somebody else, regardless of the cost. Those of you who are parents, um, my wife and I are expecting our first child, so we have about a month and a half left until we have a baby in the house. And I am soaking up the moments right now because I know, I know what you parents go through. I know what is to come. Well, I don't know, but I've seen what's to come, okay? And you guys, with your children, they are like walking grace opportunity machines because here's the thing. You clean up after them. You change them. You bathe them. You look after them. You deal with them in the midst of their temper tantrums. And guess what? They can't give you anything in return. You know what grace is because it's love that is not based on merit. It's love for the sake of love. Forgiveness can also look like, or sorry, grace can also look like forgiveness. It's um, uh, when, you're, when, when somebody wrongs you, in some way you actually have a power differential. Because whether they recognize it or not, they owe you something in return. But forgiveness is the ability to release that debt, to actually let go of it, to to even out the playing field, to, to, to say to them, you do not need to pay me back anymore. I have forgiven you. That is an act of grace. And then we have the word truth. And the word truth here is the word amet. Fun fact, this is actually where we get the phrase amen from. Amen meaning it is true or that is truth. And to us as 21st century um, uh, listeners, when we hear the word truth, we tend to think of it through scientific terms. So we think, you know, this historical event is true, or one plus one equals two, therefore it is truth. And that's, that's true, um, but the biblical imagination, uh, a met actually has a bit of a broader range. A met is connected with the idea of faithfulness. That's why Exodus 34 in our Bibles today is rendered most often as faithfulness or faithful. And this took me a little while to wrap my head around until I thought about it. And I realized that that faithfulness is directly connected to the truthfulness and trustworthiness of somebody else. Think about it. If you have a friend or somebody that, um, that you're planning to meet up with and you make plans and then you show up and then they're not there. And that's okay, that happens sometimes, but then imagine it happens a series of times, a, a number of times. Your trust in that person's faithfulness is going to deteriorate because their truth, their actions are not lining up with what they say. They're no longer faithful people. At its most basic level, tr- trustworthiness involves honesty and truth telling. I know that somebody is full of a met. I know that somebody is faithful when they tell me the truth. Like if I've got, you know, spinach in my teeth or if my fly is down and they give me that little like subtle cue that it's down. Now everybody that watches this is going to tell me these things. Uh, But that we know that those kind of people are full of a met. It can also refer to truthfulness in relationship. Like, for example, we can say that God is full of truth because he does not lie. 
or that he stands up for the truth, or that he will judge rightly. God is faithfully committed to reality. He sees the hearth harsh truths of the world, and for that matter, he sees the harsh truths of you and I. So what can we take from this? What can we take from God's character? Well, I think we can take a couple things. First of all, I think we can see that John is telling us, first of all, that Jesus is the God we find in the Old Testament, and that he connects their characters. But secondly, we also see that Jesus' character is consistent with the God of the Old Testament. I think for many of us, when we come to reading the Bible, we have a, an understandable notion, to some degree, that, uh, that the character of the God of the Old Testament is different than that of Jesus. God is maybe seen as harsh or um, a bit aggressive, whereas Jesus is seen as, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the peacemaker. You know, he's like, come on, Dad. Uh, you know, cool it down a little bit, peace and love. That's kind of how we see Jesus. But what John is saying is that is not the case. In fact, Jesus is not a different character. He is the fulfillment of, of God's character. When we look at Jesus, we see God, which tells us that as we begin to read the words and as we begin to see the actions of Jesus, we can't take it lightly. Jesus isn't another teacher or he's not a wise man, he is God. When Jesus speaks, God speaks. So we ought to listen up. Secondly, we see that Jesus' heart is positioned towards us in love. Let me read that list of characteristics from Exodus 34 again. It says, A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God's heart towards you is good. In fact, his bent tends to be towards mercy and grace. It is, it is his proclivity to love you and to lean towards you in forgiveness. Even the quality of anger is mitigated by the fact that he is slow to anger. God has a long fuse that when God sees you, he sees you with love. And I know for many of us, um, if we've been following Jesus for a while, we hear terms like God loves you or Jesus is full of grace. And They can kind of become like uh, religious wallpaper that we know is there and that we know at a cognitive level is true, but it's lost its potency. See, because I'm not convinced that we live as if Jesus truly loves us. As we live, even right now, Jesus is actively looking towards you with love and affection. And I just believe that if we really internalize that, it would change everything. And this isn't based on us, by the way. You know, God's love towards us and his faithfulness towards us is not based on what we can do. He's not faithful because we're faithful, and he's not long-suffering because we are. I even think about um, the story of the Israelites that happens right before this list of characteristics found in Exodus 34. In fact, right before this telling of God's character, we see one of the great failures in the history of the Israelites. It's the golden calf incident. For those of you who don't know, that's all good. Let me give you a Coles notes of what happens. So God frees the the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery, brings them through the waters to a, a mountain where they camp there, the mountain of Sinai. And it's here that God builds a covenant with his people. A covenant is a, um, a, a promise or a partnership based on loving commitment. Uh, we don't have necessarily a lot of covenants today. Our, our one covenant that we have that remains is the covenant of marriage. And it's here that God makes a, a partnership with his people. He says, I will be your God. You will be my people. I will love and serve you. I will guide you. I will be your Lord. I will show you the way forward. And on the other side, the the commitment of the Israelites was that they would follow him with all their life. They would listen to his commands that are for flourishing and are life-giving, and that they would live in harmony together. So what happens is Moses goes up to the mountain where he interacts with God, And he's up there for 40 days. They're like finalizing the agreement. God is giving Moses the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And while Moses is up there on ground level, the Israelites are getting frustrated because Moses has been away for a while. So they kind of think like, has he abandoned us? So they say, well, why don't we just build a God for ourselves? So they grab all their gold and they make a golden calf. And they begin to worship this calf. And Moses comes down from the mountain and sees the Israelites worshiping this calf And he is furious because in that moment, they have broken the first two commandments. 
that there shall be no other gods and that they shall build no idols. Moses drops the tablets, they shatter. Uh, he, he burns down the calf. He actually makes them drink the, the ashes. It's kind of a strange story. And, and Moses is angry, but God is even more angry because these Israelites have made a promise with him, but they broke it as quickly as they made it. And, and, and God is furious, and he says, I, I, will, I will not be the one to guide you any longer. And what follows is a series of intercession moments where Moses goes up to the mountain and fights on behalf of his people that God would still um, be their God and would still use them. In fact, at one point, Moses even offers his own life as a sacrifice for the people, which is an allusion to what Jesus is going to do. And it's because of this that God relents, turns around, and builds a commitment to his people. And it's in that moment of, of recommitting to his people that he shares his characteristic. And I love this because God shares who he is, his character, not because of the Israelites' faithfulness, but actually in the middle of their failure, because God is consistent. Jesus is consistent. He does not have bad days. He is not an unreliable source. And I can't always say that's true about myself. Like, if I'm doing deep character work, I find I, like, hit something and I deal with it, and then it's like whack-a-mole. Something else pops up. But Jesus is a place of stability. In times of crisis, we need someone who is consistent, a rock, a firm foundation. And we need somebody not just who presents himself as consistent, but somebody who actually is. And can I tell you, we can't find that in other people. We can't find that in ourselves. We can't find that in our desires or in our bank accounts or actually in any system of the world, the only place that we can find that is in the steadfast character of Jesus. So that's number one, the character of Jesus. Secondly, we learn about the invitation of Jesus. Starting in verse 18, we read this. No one has seen God. We'll get back to this at the third point. But the one and only Son, who is himself God, Another allusion to Jesus being the Word, being God, and being distinct from God, as we saw in John uh, 1, verse 1. And it says, uh, is in closest relationship with the Father. The ESV here says, who is at the Father's side. Um, the literal translation, it's a little bit funny, but is, is in the Father's bosom. It's a picture of, uh, of someone at a Jewish banquet sitting beside another of importance. So when we have a feast today, we tend to do it sitting at a, a table with chairs that are roughly like, you know, counter height, you know, or table height tables. Um, but in Jewish times, tables were actually lower and people would be seated on the ground, sitting on cushions. And for support, what they would do is they would lean on one arm and then actually rest their heads on the chest or the arms of the person beside them. I know this is like uh, very different than what we experience today. It's real close proximity. You know, like I'm picturing when you're, when you're eating, there's mouth noises, uh, you know, I, I hope that nobody's talking with their mouth open. I'm picturing when somebody's got like the, the soup, you know, they bring it to their mouth. Uh, I hope nobody spills. I don't know what's going on here, but that was the, the situation of Jewish dining at the time. And what's even cooler is that John actually connects this idea to himself at the end of, uh, or near the end of the book of John in John chapter 13. He says this, he says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John's kind of humble way of saying himself, it's like his wink to the audience that I'm actually the one that Jesus loved. Uh, he says that he was reclining next to him. See, John was leaning on the one who was leaning on God. One commentator retranslates verse 18 as saying this, no one has ever seen God except the only begotten. He has led the way into the bosom of the Father. You must, in the later words of Jesus, abide in him, or make your home in him, or rest, lean into him. And the verse ends, it says that uh, Jesus has made him known, has made God known. We can know God. How crazy is that? The, um, the unknowable, unseeable God has become known in Jesus. But there's a catch. There's a caveat. You can know God, but you cannot know him from afar. If you want to know about Jesus, you can read about him as a historical figure, 
or learn about him as a wise teacher. But if you want to know God, if you want to have a relationship with him, we don't have that option. Jesus invites us close to him to know him. I love that we've been pointing to the end of the book of John where John says that you couldn't fill up uh, the entire world with the information of Jesus because he is ever knowable. There is, there is depth to him that we can, we can spend a whole life trying to discover and we can't get to the end of it. And that is true, that we can know Jesus, that he invites us to come close to him, to know him at a deeper level. For some of you, this is an invitation for the first time to draw close to him, to know him. But for the rest of us, I believe this is also an invitation for us to know him at a deeper level. Listen, God wants you to have a greater depth of relationship with him today than you did last year, which was more than the year before. God wants us to know him at a deeper level. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the great writer, compares our knowing of God with a, a kind of infection. He says this, he says, good things as well as bad, you know, are caught by a kind of infection. If you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get in the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They are not a sort of uh, prizes which God could, if he chose, just hand out to anyone. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will wet you. If you are not, you will remain dry. The invitation is that God is calling you close. And that brings us to our third point today. And the third point is this, the gift of Jesus. Notice a few times throughout this passage, we read um, that Jesus, uh, or sorry, John compares what we have now as greater than what we had in the past. Uh, let's start in verse 16. It says, Out of his fullness, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So out of the fullness of God's character, we have received something greater. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. Logically, this makes sense. Uh, Moses was given the law, which was an act of God's grace. The law was God's gracious way to help people flourish and walk with integrity in their lives. So Moses was a kind of mediator giving the people uh, the message of the grace of God. But in Jesus, we see something different because we don't see somebody who's telling us about God but we hear the words of God himself. Moses told us about God's grace, but Jesus embodied it. Later it says this, it says, no one has ever seen God. This is actually a great Old Testament theme, and it's about the holiness of God. It's saying that God is so holy that in contrast with our unholiness, if we were to actually see his glory and his holiness face to face, we would drop dead because he is the pinnacle of perfection. There's this moment in the chapter just before Exodus 34 where Moses has an interaction in one of his intercession moments where he asks God if he can see him. And this is, what's, this is what happens. It says, starting in verse 19 of Exodus 33, And Yahweh said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So here Moses sees a glimpse of God. He sees the back of God, and it's a moment of great glory and and, and power. But with Jesus, the claim is much greater. We see here the writer of John telling us that uh, he's seen God. He's seen Jesus and his facial expressions as he interacted with sinners and as he healed people, and as he sat down for a meal, and as he cried out on the cross, and as he rose again resurrected, John has seen God. And what he's telling us is that we too can see 
Jesus. This begs the question, why do we receive this gracious gift when Moses couldn't? Why do we get to know God through the word and through the life of Jesus and, and even more through his Holy Spirit living and dwelling and making his home within us? Is it because we are more moral than Moses? Um, are we more advanced than Moses? Like was, you know, the ancient people were more archaic, but we're advanced, we can, we can understand it better. Or maybe it's because God had a change of heart at some point, he thought, nah, I'll let him see me. I don't think that's the case. What makes us more worthy recipients on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection is not us, but is Jesus himself. See, because John 1, verse 18, actually points us to the end of the book. It points us to the climax of the story. There is a moment where we see grace and truth most fully embodied, and that is on the cross. See, because it's on the cross that we experience the tension pull of who Jesus is. On the one hand, you see the fullness of his truth, that God created human beings to flourish and to live in relationship with him and with others. But on the first pages of scripture, we see that humans chose and opted not to follow God, but to de define and design their life for themselves, to define good and evil on their own terms. And now we live in a world that is good, but it is marked by evil, sin, and selfish desires. And, and, and since the moment of evil's entering, God has been on a mission. He has vowed to deal and eradicate uh, evil for good. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds amazing. Like, imagine living in a world without pain and suffering and death and sorrow. God, bring it on now. But there's a big problem. And the problem is this. If we were being honest, the evil that we see on the news or in dysfunctional relationships or in our interactions with other people towards us, if we were really being true, also has roots within me. It also has roots within every human being. Sure, the, uh, the manifestation of those roots looks different in different people, but if we were being honest, we don't know where we would be at given a different circumstance or a different upbringing or a different set of events that happened to us. So, this is the problem. If Jesus were to deal with and eradicate evil, he would also have to eradicate you and I. And it's not like we can hide this from God. It's not like we can, we can try to mask that, because here's the thing, God knows you more than you know yourself. He has a more realistic view of who you actually are. He doesn't see you through your like uh, rose-colored lenses of who you are. And there's no internal PR tactics or spin that can mask who we are. God knows you so well. And our reality is measured up against the truth of who God is and who we are called to be. And time and time again, we fall short. That's the one hand. But on the other hand, we have grace. Grace being undeserved favor. And this is the grace of God, that he loves you so dearly. He cares about you so much that Jesus took on what we deserved in order that we could receive what we don't. The cry of grace in scripture is, uh, let me find favor in your eyes. And we see on the cross that the Father turns his face away from Jesus as he takes on our sins in order that when he looks towards us, he does not see us marked by our failures, but he sees us through the lens of Jesus' sacrifice and we are made clean and whole again. This is grace. We talked about how grace is shown in subversion to human power structures. Well, we see that Jesus came under the, the structures of evil in order that the, the scales could be tipped in our favor, in order that we might be raised up. And somehow, on the cross, both, both grace and truth are reconciled. And this is what we know as the gospel. As one writer says, the gospel is this, that we are more sinful than we ever dare hope imagine, and yet at the exact same moment, we are far more loved than we could ever hope for. These two realities exist. God's faithfulness to truth is displayed in that evil was paid for, 
But at the same moment, God's gracious love was displayed in that he took our place. Jesus exposed himself to the, to the weight of sin in order that you and I wouldn't have to. On the cross, we can know this, that we're both fully loved and fully known. As Tim Keller puts it, to be loved and not known is superficial. It doesn't hold any weight or value. To be known and not loved is our great fear. To actually have somebody know you and not receive you with love is detrimental to the human heart. But to be known and loved, that transforms you. And this is the gift of Jesus, is that because of what he's done, he's made a way for us to be close to him. And like all good gifts, what do we do with it? Well, we don't try to earn our way to receive it. We don't try to pay it back. We don't try to work hard enough in order that we can get to the point where we can take it. We receive it with a joyful heart because we know that is what changes us. Grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, we just are so humbled by who you are. We know that your character is steadfast and good that when you look towards us, your heart, your proclivity is to, to show us grace and love. And God, I just pray right now that those who are hearing this message would know this and it wouldn't just hit at a uh, superficial note, but it would actually pierce beyond their, their, their minds, their hearts, that your love would transform them from the inside out. God, we thank you for the gift of the gospel that you loved us enough to pay the price, that through your death and resurrection, we can have a new life. And God, I just ask that as we um, move forward now into the story of your life, that we'd, we'd hear it with fresh ears, ready to, to hear from you in new and beautiful ways. In Jesus' name, amen. We all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The glory of God is woman fully alive. We are sisterhood. We are mothers and daughters, sisters and friends. We are artists and scientists, doctors and teachers. We are coffee lovers and laughter lovers and lovers of people and souls. We are here for the generations, leaving lasting legacies of glory that will change the world. We are sisterhood, we are fully alive, and we are ready to experience God's glory. This is Sisterhood Conference 2021, the online experience. How much do we love Brandon? And every time he teaches, it literally, it just explodes on the inside of me. I love how he sees things in scripture and brings life to it to us. So I pray that truly blessed you. And Sisterhood Conference, it is coming very, very close. We are excited to offer it to you on online this time. It wasn't our original plan, but you know what? We're going with it and it's going to be fantastic. Listen, you and your friends can register for just $25. You're not gonna get that deal again. And it's, it's a full, beautiful package of great teaching and so many God moments are going to happen. You don't wanna miss out. So be sure that you register and register the people in your world and have a little watch party. Whatever we're allowed to do, get that many women in your house and party hard. I'm kicking you out. <laughs> and I can't wait for just a little while from now, um, we're actually gonna have our community, which meets online, and we're gonna hear uh, different people experiences. How did you experience grace? How do yeah. you experience truth? And, and I think, it just takes the message and makes it real. So if yeah. you're not in a community group, um, go online, let us know. I will help you plug into one that makes a difference in your life. But thank you for watching. We really do love you. Have a great day. Have a great day and a week. <laughs>